Welcome to LD Disrupt, the podcast dedicated to helping you overcome workplace challenges and prepare for the future of work today. I'm your host, Nelson Sidlingham, and I'll be speaking with the movers, shakers, and path breakers in LD who are reshaping their organizations right now. Join us each week as we delve into the highs and lows of work in the industry to get to the real nitty gritty stuff that you actually care about. Welcome everyone back to another episode of LD Disrupt Live. Joining myself and Nelson this week, we've got Ajay Jacob and Kevin Alston. Uh, Ajay is workplace learning designer and strategist currently working as an L&D manager at TomTom in the Netherlands, like we said. And Kevin is currently Synthesia's learning strategist and also has a background in learning experience design. So um, yeah, again, welcome both of you to the show. It's good to be here. Thank you. Uh, Obviously, as people will know from the title, we're going to talk a little bit about how the economic downturn is going to affect L&D teams, why it might be an opportunity and how we can provide value. But Nelson, before we hear from Kevin and Ajay, maybe you can tell us, set the scene, give us a bit of context around what this economic downturn means for businesses, but also L&D teams working within those businesses. I feel like I need to kind of reference it's my economic degree from from back in the day. But um, yeah, I guess kind of summarize where we're at right now is with interest rates um, going up across across the world. It means essentially it's more difficult for businesses and individuals uh, to, to borrow. And if it's more difficult or expensive to borrow, you end up essentially spending less and saving more. Now, if individuals as consumers are essentially um, spending less money, it means businesses are typically making less money, therefore not growing as fast as um, they would expect. And on the flip side, if businesses are spending less money, that often manifests itself in either layoffs um, or hiring freezes or both. And when you look around what's kind of happening in the market right now, um, essentially we are seeing some of the biggest companies uh, around the world laying off a significant share of the workforce. But what we're seeing a lot more of is hiring freezes um, because essentially businesses have less money. Now, it might sound very morbid and definitely it is going to be a challenging time ahead. Um, but believe me when I say there is an opportunity hidden in there for l and to, to really kind of demonstrate uh, value because essentially what it now means is it's too expensive for businesses to buy or borrow the skills that they need um, their teams to have in order for the business to to continue to grow. And so the most economical thing for them to do right now is to build those skills with the existing talent within the organization. And so what that kind of does is there's a new spotlight uh, that will now be on on L&D, but also there'll be more pressure than ever before uh, to do more with less, and hence the reason why that's the, the topic for the day. Perfectly put. And um, Kevin, maybe we'll come to you first. What are your thoughts on what Nelson said there? And you know, how do you feel about this current situation? Obviously, as Nelson alluded to, it's a difficult time as well as a time that presents an, an opportunity. Sure. So uh, I think what you're saying about the spotlight on LMD coming up with those internal solutions, I think that resonates with me because I really see our, uh, if there's any theme to impart for today, it's that LMD can't do it alone. And so part of our role is really we're the the connectors. I, I feel like we're like the organizational spiders on the org chart where we don't, we may sit on a team, but we don't, uh, we, we have connections throughout the entire organization. So it's our job to pull all those together, all those resources together into the right place. And as far as uh, at this time, uh, I uh, I feel the word is not optimistic, but I get hungry um, because I know that it's time to go looking for trouble. It's time to go searching for problems to solve, uh, and that uh, if the learning department budget has been cut, there's a high chance that everyone's budget has been cut. And so what this means, uh, what this tells me is that when I go talking to other departments, everybody's going to be hyper-focused on trying to uh, highlight that uh, that particular problem that they're trying to solve. What's the skills gap that they have or the resource gap that they have? And so when I'm talking with folks, I'm listening for those sets and stars. If I just had this or I need a, a person who can do this, that means that we're not talking necessarily about environment uh, factors, things that are harder to change as LMD folks, but we're looking at skills, we're looking at motivations and uh, bite-sized places to start. 
So uh, I think it's not a, I don't mean to be opportunistic, but I also think it hyper-focuses our conversations and it helps meet people where they actually need something rather than uh, us trying to search it out for ourselves. Yeah, perfect. And uh, Ajay, how about you? Do you think it is that opportunity just to focus more and sort of narrow down the real areas where you can make a difference? And so how do you feel about the situation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that was perfect um, sort of, intro if you like from by by nelson and i i totally agree that with every crisis if you like there's always an opportunity but um i think particularly for lnd i feel like as a function um we've been fairly used to doing more with having to do more with less right i feel like that's historically been the case um and i think um during covid or just after maybe there was a sudden sort of spotlight on LND. There was maybe some some short-term investment because there was a crisis and we needed to sort of get through it. And now it feels like due to completely different reasons, we've reverted back to the way it was before. Um, so in some ways, LND professionals, people who've been in 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 this line of work for some time will be sitting here thinking, yeah, we're kind of used to this, you know, nothing's really changed. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it is hard, right? I mean, it's it's very. It, it, in in some ways, we knew this was coming, but in other ways, um, I think a lot of it has been sort of unexpected outcomes of this whole VUCA environment we're in, and so it's difficult to plan, put in place those contingency measures, and so then you end up just being in firefighting mode all the time, um, and that's and that's difficult. So 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 yes, you can focus on certain things that provide the most impact. But I think, you know, there's also recognition. We know that, right? So it's very tough time out there, even for people within L&D, you know, with companies laying off. You know, L&D isn't immune from that. There are people who have just transitioned into L&D, have, you know, struggling to land a job, people, you know. So so it is really tough. I think there's, um, so it's, I think it's really important to be yeah, also sensitive to that. Um, so what, how, how can we best support the businesses, the companies we're working in? But also, how can we support each other as L and D, um, you know, practitioners, professionals? Um, because yeah, that's because that's a very tough environment to be working in. When you're worried about your own employment, your own you know career, it's very difficult then to shift that focus outward into you know your your role and be as effective as you want to be. So I think both those are very important. So I'm really um, keen to hear from others as well. Of, you know, I know there's a lot of really that community aspect is growing. It's grown a lot over COVID. Um, and I hope that will continue and sort of pivot where needs be so that we can all support each other and, and just um, make, make, that, make that impact that we all want to make. Mm. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Kevin, was, did you want to add anything or Nelson before we sort of move on um, sort of into that topic more of finding the right problems? Yeah, I guess, I guess you can pick up the, the finding the right problems, but definitely agree with what I did. I just said it, it's a tough time, right? And I think it's finding the balance between um, it is challenging and navigating those challenges, and you've got your own um, challenges to, to deal with. Um, but I guess you, know, you need to move forward, right? And 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 therefore, it's trying to what we're hopefully by, by the end of this live show and what we're trying to do with the conversations and, and discussion doesn't stop just in this show, right? We can continue it afterwards, but what we're trying to do is how do we navigate um, the times ahead? And, and I think the parallel RJ drew to um, the pandemic is, is, is a really important one because um, yes, we're about to go through a lot of unknown and uncertainty, but we just came out of a lot of unknown and uncertainty and, and you know, a lot of us are still going through it. And so if anything, that's kind of prepped us up. It's just a different kind of challenge that we need to navigate. And I think it's really important to, to kind of lean on the community, uh, as Ajay said. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, I guess we can really get into that issue of, well, one thing you mentioned, Ajay, is, is fighting fires, right? And it's likely that a lot are gonna pop up, but I guess part of the issue here is being proactive, isn't it, as well, and working out where, you're going to add the most value but also at the same time when you're scaling anything back there's a nature to cut corners isn't there and cut things out so it's a kind of a two-pronged thing one is to work out where you can add the most value and then the second thing is where do i actually not cut corners because that actually 
it might work short term, but it could have a longer term ramification. So kind of what are your thoughts on the best ways people now can focus on how they're going to add value and make sure they're not cutting the wrong corners? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, so so I think that's that's going to be the one of the biggest challenges, right? Finding that balance, um, because obviously when budgets are cut, some of those decisions in a way get made for you. And there's there's a lot of things that are out of your control, and 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 you suddenly have three or four things that are have been identified as you know your main priorities, um, and you want to sort of yeah just crack on and 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 do some of those things, but at the same time yeah like Nelson said, it isn't just about the present, um, it is about looking forward into that future because we know this will. Things will get better, right? And I th so it was very it was very similar during the pandemic when I was speaking to L and D leaders, people in their teams. They were in the same sort of struggle of, um, you know, do I just focus all my attention on on firefighting and getting through this, or do I start to think about what's coming around the corner? Because we we know things will get better. The pandemic isn't going to last forever, and we know that now. Uh, but now it's a different set of problems. So, so being proactive, I think, is one of those huge things that, um, and that comes, you know, th this, th just that strategic thinking, just being able to sort of come up for air, have these kind of discussions, see what else is going on, spotting those trends, so that you be, so that you are getting more proactive. Um, and one of the things I read recently was a really interesting concept of, I think it was operational debt, right? And I think the analogy that was used is that you know if it's not, when you're in a crisis you're you're falling through the air and you're building your parachute at the same time. Um, at that point, you know you don't want to make the world's most perfect parachute. You just want a parachute that works, right? Once you've but once you've landed, um, you, you you have to sort of it's incumbent on you to improve that parachute so that it's ready for the next time. And that was this, so this idea of, of um, operational debt is that when you're going through these things and you're just doing the minimum just th that needs to be done to get you through the crisis, you end up accumulating operational debt. And then you have to start paying that back when things stabilize. And by that, I mean, you've got to start putting the processes in place. You've got to be thinking about, you know, how you can support for the long term. You know, so so it isn't useful to just constantly be in firefighting mode. I mean, there's a lot of things that go wrong. Most, you know, one of the things we've seen a lot is just people burning out. So there needs to be that step back every once in a while and say, look, we know things are going to get better. How do we plan for the future so that we're not encountering a whole other set of problems because of the actions or inactions in the present, right? So I think that's where the balance um, for me comes from. So as learning to, as learning uh, and development professionals, there is that focus on the performance support element, helping people do their jobs right now. But we know that there's going to be, the war on talent isn't going to get, you know, it's going to continue to be an issue. We've got to be able to grow people for their next step in, in, their, in their role, in their career. Um, and that requires, you know, more long-term planning. So it's the performance support in the now, help people to work in the, in the best and most efficient way possible but you know, give plan for the future, and I think it's also important from a just from an you know well-being perspective to think you have something to look forward to, right? I mean, what this is this is not going to last forever. I have something exciting, um, some some new role, some new opportunity that I can take on, um, and and that is going to help give you some of that energy um, and the impetus to pull through. Um, so for me, that's also I think a role that we can play and help play. Yeah, and sorry, yeah, you were about to come in there. Well, I, I, you caught me just being too excited because uh, Jay, that I, that's all I've been reading about lately, which is moving from, the, there's the trend of learning in the flow of work, which I think was uh, a pretty big discussion topic last year. And it's since evolved. Uh, I read a, a, the most recent Josh Burson article was about uh, growth in the flow of work where uh, you're now, you should be, everything that you offer uh, employees should be also with their career pathway in mind. What, what can they be building skills and that will help them in their future career, whether it's at your company or the next. And uh, the way he framed this in perspective is that um, 
given the downturn into tight what we were talking to earlier before it's that in this uh in this year 30 percent of u.s workers are expected to leave their jobs for for another one and that um they were expected a 30 percent wage increase so there's incentive for them to leave your resource strapped company for for something else but then also it's about um it what's the worst thing that can happen for your company in a resource strapped time is if your internal experts leave so it's how can you connect the internal experts with the business problems that you have but also thinking about connecting your internal experts with the people who need them and so uh i often uh, again i often think about i can l d can't do this alone it's not this top-down training that we're offering or, or things that are heavy interventions it's how do we connect people with the right people who can answer those problems but also thinking about how can we connect people with people who are going to give them those skills later on in their career and provides, like you said, something to look forward to, something that uh, people can will, will actually seek out. Um, and so the other thing that that, that tackles, I think, uh, the emotional the emotional part, the motivation for why people are going to take our trainings or not take our trainings, but uh, to uh, consume our learning experiences. It's because they want to know that this is not just going to solve the problems of right now, but it's going to be additive to their future pathway. It's going to open them up to if they want to switch industries or if they even want to switch teams, these skills have to be something that uh, are going to be additive to that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think there's... Um... An interesting angle that is a common like marketing phrase that features tell and benefits sell. But the thing that always gets left off of there is like the narrative or story is what wins people over to be invested in it. And that's like kind of what you're alluding to there. People need to believe that uh, the short term pain they might experience now is going to have that kind of long term gain as well to, to get people on board. Uh, Nelson, I guess something Ajay and Kevin both alluded to there is that there needs to be planning. Right. And this is something that typically is a corner that gets cut when times get tough. We just like you said before, people just get tempted to do more. So I guess is now an opportunity to plan more, analyze more and not just reactively do more. Yeah, definitely. I think two things come off the, the back of what Kevin and Ajay just said. Um, the first one being you know, not to get sucked into that firefighting and, and often prioritization is is what the challenge is there. And, and you don't make you know, the person who's shouting the loudest doesn't necessarily get what they want and you don't think that's urgent, therefore you end up doing that uh, and the kind of age-old kind of reactive or, or to take uh, that, that kind of behaviour coming from this has been escalated, therefore I need to do this. So I think really having a uh, prioritisation framework that allows you to make informed decisions quickly is critical at a time like this because, you, you know, given you've got limited resources, you can't afford to be... Um, investing those resources in um, in essentially initiatives or learning experiences that are not going to have the desired impact on, on solving that business challenge. Um, so a lot of the L&D leaders we've been working with, um, it's become quite common for them to use the ICE framework. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the ICE framework, it's um, impact, confidence and effort. Um, from an impact perspective, you're essentially scoring um, you know, what? Imp uh, how big is the impact do you think solving this challenge will have? Um, and then the confidence part is how confident are you that this learning experience or solving this challenge will have the desired uh, impact? Um, and then the last one, effort, is you rating exactly, you know, how much effort do you think it's going to take? And the more unknown there is or the more, um, you know, for example, do, do you need to bring in external help versus is leveraging internal experts that might be uh, an indication of how much effort but scoring your kind of challenges and experiences based on this framework essentially gives you numbers to play with and, and often this is where i see l d not using numbers enough and um it's, it's really getting some hard metrics on the table um that make it easy to communicate and discuss this not just within the l d team but as kevin said with different stakeholders across the business, right? They, it's an easy enough framework and scoring system uh, for anyone in any part of the business to be able to understand what you're trying to communicate. Um, so I think it's the prioritization piece. And then, Gary, come to the planning piece. What you often see in a time like this, especially if you're worried for your job, um, is you try to rush to create as much output as possible because you think showing more output is me showing you, look, I I'm doing so much work. You really need me in the company, so you don't want to let go of me, and I I'm, I'm earning my money. Um, but this is the time for you to avoid doing that. 
Because the last thing you want to be doing is sucking up resources into producing lots of output that has no impact on the business whatsoever. So take the time up front to make sure you are finding the right problems. You are prioritizing. Um, you're testing and iterating before you scale and take up more resources. And so now is the time, as much as it might seem counterintuitive, now is the time to spend more time upfront planning on the problem discovery, um, on, on analyzing and doing all of that so you can make sure you're increasing the probability of achieving that desired impact. Yeah, yeah, Kevin and Ajay, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on what Nelson just said there. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think in this kind of situation, you know, obviously the data is always important. But in this kind of situation, when people are watching the numbers much more closely, they become critical, right, to, to every decision that you want to make. And you want to be backing it up with data because obviously, um, yeah, when the budget's limited, you, that's, that's ultimately what decisions get made on. Um, so that's something we should, yeah, that... I think we can all uh, agree that uh, we've been lagging behind on in terms in, in L&D traditionally, something that I, I, we need to um, uh, get better at for sure. And and I, I agree on 100% on the planning thing. What I would add to that is that I think to me, it also seems like a good time to, to run those experiments, um, you know, those low stake, low stakes experiments that you know, that you can, you know, just a little pilot, just to test things um, that don't cost a lot of money, but can potentially, you know, lead to a lot of, you know, great innovative solutions. Um, and it's maybe you won't have the opportunity to scale it now, but when things get better, you'd have done a lot of the, you know, the lab work, the field work, if you like, right? Um, to help you then take that idea and say, maybe, maybe we can do something with this. Um, so I think that's also an opportunity there to say, okay, um, you know, we've, we've freed up some resource potentially here because, you know, this has been cut or whatever. Um, so think about how you could redeploy that in, in, in some creative ways, um, that, that may lead to, to, to potentially, you know, um, unexpected, uh, results, um, which might help down the line. And, and, I, and I think adding on to that, Ajay, it, it also makes me think, uh, you, you kind of alluded to it, to it there, but this idea of um, of re uh, being creative or, or look, taking stock of what you already have and um, trying to reuse that, I think, uh, you know, LMD, if we can push forward behavior change and not have to spend any extra dollars, of course, time costs money in the long run. But if you can show, uh, if you can show value with the resources that you already have, then I think that is, uh, you know, how you make the winning case for, hey, we spent, uh, you know, this is how much it costs to produce these, which is not technically zero, but um, how can you resize the re learning resources you already have? I always tend to think of any sort of intervention we have, whether it's the highest intervention, whether that's training or if it's a job aid, everything should, especially when you're in a resource strap time, I'm, I'm pushing maybe a little too hard this idea of t-shirt sizes where it's what are the objectives or what are the skills you're trying to teach and how do you size that up? What is the, if in, if training and one-on-one -on -one coaching is the, the extra, extra large version, what is the extra small version and how, uh, or what is the, the medium version of that? Is that a, an, a, a, a podcast episode? Is that a, a different type of job aid or, or some sort of framework you can use? And so, um, it, it's a really about, taking what you already have and uh, like you said, being more creative with it and, and figuring out what else you can do. And, and just building on, on, oh, I, I was just gonna build on that idea of the experimental and, and starting with the small, medium t-shirt size, and I love that um, analogy, but it, it's really the idea of, I often like to make parallels between startups and L&D teams and how often they're much like the same, but in, in a startup space, um, when you're raising your first bit of external funding, you need to build your minimum viable product to kind of demonstrate a, a kind of proof of concept. You know, this, this product does solve a problem um, and customers are willing to pay for it. Um, and once you demonstrate that kind of early signs of traction is when you're able to kind of raise that bigger capital. And it's much the same with what we're talking about here is you know, with L&D teams essentially creating uh, minimum valuable learning where they're able to, you know, those small 
uh, nuggets of knowledge and, and, and micro learning experiences that can show early signs that they're moving um, the individual to in the direction of the desired impact. And, and that is you know, so often teams rush into scaling something across the entire business or going for the whole extra extra large, as Kevin said, um, from day one, uh, without having, you know, just to find out that it didn't work, that actually you could have found out it wasn't going to work um, by only spending um, less money and less time and less effort. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, actually, before we move on, there was one thing Kevin said that I wanted to ask you about, which is really when it comes to reading the room, when it comes to using tools that you have at your disposal. So, for example, just because you have access to a bunch of tools right now or you could create a leaderboard, you know, like maybe you can tell us a bit more about why now is the moment to read the room and then make your decisions accordingly in, in terms of that aspect as well. Yeah, I think um, so reading the room uh, is, is a good so I like the phrase. I, I think it's something we always need to do, but but particularly now, you know, just being a little extra sensitive to people. I mean, there's a lot going on in the room, right? So reading the room is sometimes harder, but it's but it's more it, it's 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 so important. I um so I, I agree. I also love what Kevin said about t-shirt sizes. I do like that analogy. And I, I, I've tried to put it in, in, into practice, just this whole idea of repurposing the same piece of content, you know, so, um, you know, and, and just, I think it just helps you think a little bit more about the end user. So, um, you know, and, and you're trying, I think it ties into segmentation and just kind of tailoring your message and that with that slight tweaking, you essentially have you, you build up a much wider portfolio rather than trying that whole you know one size fits all um, business. So um, with with t-shirt sizes, I mean it's a very easy to remember analogy, but and but I like it a lot. Coming back to leaderboards, that so that's a good one. You know I think um, some some of the things that maybe worked under normal circumstances may be counterproductive now, right? Um, because just it, it, it's, it's people's circumstances have changed. Um, so I think, yeah, applying things that maybe worked in the past to the present situation also isn't helpful. And and so that is, yeah, about reading that room, you know, it's it's in the smaller smallest things sometimes, which can be very easily overlooked. Um, but understanding what people's um, situations are and thinking very carefully about does gamification work in this context, um, is a hard deadline useful in this context? Um, just things like that, I think, can really make a big difference. And it's part of what we do um, in terms of meeting learners where they're at. Um, just It's not just understanding their workflow. It's understanding everything else that's going on. People's work um, routines, you know, the, the, the entire sort of um, life um, patterns have been completely disrupted over the last two years. People have formed a lot of new habits. They're not consuming learning or working in the same way. There's just so much has changed. Um, and that means we're constantly having to, you know, change the way we work as well so that we continue to be, um, to, um, yeah, to, to just be uh, relevant and sensitive. Yeah, yeah I think... Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Jay. You, you, you're inspiring me a lot. Uh, somebody who, uh, something that, someone who that reminds me of is someone who I'm, I'm recently following a lot of her stuff on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Stacey Young Rivers. She's the senior director of, of people growth at WB Discovery. She uh, has this great study, which we can talk a little bit about later, called Level Up on Learning, where it was under. It was a, a study that she did where it was attempting to find out what people prefer, or what learners prefer, and, and how they're uh, gaining access to learning content. And her big takeaway from that uh, was aligning the learning ecosystem to what people want. And so I think we we have this idea in in uh, learning design of meeting people where they're at. But sometimes it's uh, I think what I'm finding in my own experience is that it's about putting things where people can find them and looking at the learning ecosystem and saying what resources do we have instead of me doing more pushing. It's me. I, I feel like I'm. Uh, the, the image that comes to mind is very vivid, but like laying out a salt lick and then the learners are like, oh, I'm thirsty or I'm hungry. And so they're like, you know, timidly coming out of the woods. And then it's like, oh, this is what exactly what I needed. That's the approach that I feel like 
I, has made the biggest shift in in terms of me presenting resources to people. Is I'm I'm the scariest person that can, or not the scariest person, but the person that they don't want to see. But uh, really, they want to see other people's expertise and other people's work. And I know that from our last conversation at Jay, you're talking about the importance of the L and D team is often not the most exciting person in the room. Often it's the expert who's embedded with the team because we're just the people who come around when we want you to do something. Does it all? Is it always additive to your work? So, I'm really sorry I, I, that I called our learners, you know, deer coming out of the woods. But it's really, are you? Are they going to use this? These resources? Are they going to use this training? Because it doesn't matter what we create if they're not going to consume it in a way that's useful to them. Then it doesn't matter what type of analysis and discovery you do. You have to place it to where they'll, they'll, they'll uh, what makes sense to them. Mm. No one will believe L and D are not the most exciting. People after meeting you too, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Don't worry about that. Um, but I, I love the idea of you know meeting where and um, where and uh, you know what people need. And I think we talk about this a lot when we're building how now this idea of you know when you embed learning within existing habits, you reduce the barriers of access and and you reduce the friction. Um, and you know they are and by embedding it in a habit, it is you know meeting employees where they are and, and realizing you know, the employees are not primarily learners, right? That, that's not their only persona, quote unquote, right? They're, they're doing other stuff. They, they spend 80% of their day inside other apps, not your LMS or learning platform. So why wouldn't you meet them where they're spending 80% of their time? You know, it, it seems when you step back and look at the idea that you're trying to take someone away from the context they're in, into a completely different platform, app, or system that they don't use, rather than sending the learning into the app or system that they already spend most of their time in. It, it seems like a crazy idea to try to convince people to do that. But I think the bigger picture is once you start embedding access to learning in those existing habits, um, you start to see people will um, able to discover things within the relevant concepts, right? And we often talk about in learning transfer, the idea of near transfer and broad transfer. Uh, not to say all learning needs to be about near transfer, but it's a good starting point because I, I'm a big, big fan of feedback loops. And I think what this does is when you have, you're able to connect people with relevant learning in that moment of need or in the context of that need, and they're able to apply it more immediately, you create a positive feedback loop. You know, I, I find it, I use it, I see the consequences of it, positive feedback loop. Now I'm more likely to go back, engage, and use it again. Um, and that positive feedback loop is, is what we're often missing, um, I think, in, in the world of workplace learning. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, I you know, I think this is why platforms that that are taking that that radical approach of of trying to just you know meet learners in their workflow rather than bringing everybody over um, to to this big system, you know, it, it feels like um, you know there was just this understanding that we'll make build it and we will come and they will come and and clearly. Um, you know, that's that's not the case. And I think the pandemic and all the changes that it has brought has made that even more absurd as an idea. Um, so I, I just find it staggering that, that, that platforms will put all this effort into building something that just works a certain way, that has very little customization, that has very little opportunities for learners to come in and make it their own experience. Um, and you know, even a phone, even like the cheapest phone right now you can buy has all these options that you can, you know, change and, and make it feel like your own. Um, and, and that's something that more platforms should be doing. And from, you know, what I've seen of how now, I think that's, it's a positive approach that you're taking, right? Helping be, being flexible enough to accommodate people's needs and preferences. Um, is the way to go because in most other platforms you just set the rules you've defined the rules and that's how they work for the last 10 years um whereas how now is thinking and that's not a fixed point in time right that's constantly evolving so how are people learning now that's what we need to understand more as l d professionals all the time and that, that's where those feedback loops and all of those things really come into play because it's not like you feel you've understood your learner and we're good for the next 10 years 
that's clearly, I mean, the, the rate of change and the rate of technology that people are just using outside of, you know, the learning domain is just so, it's just so rapid. And unless we are keeping pace, we're just, it, people are just not going to bother with it because it just seems like a redundant technology from the 1980s or whatever, you know, so. Yeah, so I think more more uh, platforms should be taking um, that approach. Is is that was my little soapbox uh, thing there. But I would love to, you know, also hear from more people in the chat. And maybe if you come off camera, there's a lot of familiar names I see on screen. So it would be great to also just yeah hear whether this is resonating and also hear from other people about their experiences and what they've been doing as well. Definitely, no, so not be music to your ears there because obviously. <laughs> how now praise and a lot of themes from your book coming out there so um a plug for both um i guess one thing we spoke about there is is people and managing people and i guess there's two situations here managing like you said the learners but also managing upwards and i guess a lot of teams will be finding themselves in a position now where they're getting maybe questions from stakeholders or pushback from people higher up saying you know is do we still need to invest in lnd now is it the right time do we still need to do it um, so maybe I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how people can respond to that and um, sort of keep people on side, win them over, show the value. Um, Kevin, maybe we'll start with you and bring in Ajay and Nelson. Uh, as far as uh, justifying the case of L&D, I, I think it's, it's always a, if we find ourselves in that position where we're trying to justify the case for L&D, that's it's a it's a argument that we can't win in the long run and i think it part of it has to do with the fact that it, there's the expectation that you're always going to be trying to prove a case with numbers that are hard to crunch or skills that you don't have and you're trying to prove that case to uh your senior leadership team should lnd continue to, to exist and this is why i keep advocating for you if you're not already there you should be the organizational spider you should be uh what comes to mind is is varus from game of thrones and sorry i haven't seen the new one but you should have little birds everywhere looking for business problems and people to align with because uh learn either because uh, lnd is is just not unless you're at a uh, you're doing a sterling job at your uh at your company you've completely saved the business it's going to be always a hard case to prove and so uh i find that when you're making your case it always helps to bring friends along and so two of those people that i have for for every initiative there's always a change champion where it's someone on slt who knows your work and knows the value that you bring and then the other person is the influencer, some high level person uh, on a cross functional team who can um, who can explain how you uh, told their story to other learners or how you brought their resources to other people. And with that, you're then trying to make the case to S you, you then have allies in your case to SLT. Should we uh, should we uh, keep our L and D team? You need other people to tell your story. Yeah, it's about building up that wealth of social proof, isn't it? Like if someone asks you, of course, you're going to tell them that your job is still really useful and you're doing a great job. Exactly. And um, someone else's feedback is more impartial, I guess, isn't it? Um, yeah. Nelson and, and Ajay, anything to add on, on what Kevin said there and that, that topic of handling stakeholders? Ajay, go on. Well, no, I, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the stakeholder piece is obviously that's something that everyone should be doing more of we we've been we've been trying to do a lot of a lot more co-creation working with subject matter experts you know helping them um you know sort of be part of that process um but i think for me one of the things that i would say is to not often the case uh, with lnd is that we just focus on the upskilling piece right and it's it's about that's where um, that's the return on investment. Is has somebody picked up a skill or changed a behavior? Um, but we've seen how that can. That's just one side of it, right? That's one because what what you have what you end up happening is if you just focus all that time and effort on upskilling, but if you then don't have the opportunities, um, you then it you then lead to it just leads to a lack of engagement. And you know everyone's talking now about quiet quitting. I don't think we can get through this podcast without mentioning that. Um, I mean it's. Um, every second person on LinkedIn is talking about it. Um, fundamentally, it's a lack of engagement. And if you think about, um, you know, learning and development, we sometimes just think of it in a very narrow sense of upskilling. But to me, it's much wider than that. It feeds into the entire employee experience. And if you think about somebody who is not engaged in their job, it's 
um, they, they've maybe very, very highly skilled, but just don't see the next step for them in that organization or in that team or whatever it is. And that's where you see the rise of, you know, talent platform marketplaces and things like that. I think it's so important to think of it as that entire employee experience, that journey, and see where we can work with the right people, the right stakeholders at every step of that. So one of the th things that we're trying to do at TomTom Tom is also think about how L&D can be set up as more of a customer success team. And if you think, so all, all the, the learn, all our colleagues all are, are all our customers. How are we setting them up for success? What are some of the lessons we can take from our customer facing teams in the business to deploy within the L&D team um, and help make our offerings to um, our customers and stakeholders better. So I think that's, I think it's very interesting, right? Because this whole, everyone was just talking about upskilling. And to me, there's so many more dimensions of that. And, and quiet quitting is just one manifestation of that. Um, so it's interesting, very interesting times for L&D, for HR teams in general. Um, and I'm just very excited to see how we can help move the needle. And just building on that, I think the idea of seeing L&D teams as a customer success team is a, is a really, really powerful one. Because if you kind of extrapolate that, um, essentially looking at that external customer facing team, um, you need to be able to tell the story about the value you're providing those customers. Again, something we've spoken about earlier that uh, many L&D teams haven't been effective at telling that um, the, the sales narrative behind what value um, L&D bring to the table, which a customer success team would be expected to do. The customer success team also knows what the measure of that success is, right? They're, they're tracking how long it takes to get to that first wow moment, right? And, and that first wow moment is where you've delivered that first point of value. And, and there's a measure behind that. You know once your customers got to that point. Again, going back to what we've discussed earlier, L&D don't always know what that metric is. They don't know once we've reached that point where we know we've got that first sign of success um, for our internal customer. So I think a lot of those things we've spoken around um, you know, and touching on what Kevin mentioned around measuring, I think, again, we've spoken about this in previous episodes, but there's too much of an emphasis on trying to find binary numbers that tell a very black and white story about did l and have an impact or not. There, there's not a jury there waiting to say guilty or not guilty. This is what we need to be able to build the story around is did l and influence the, the behavior change that we saw in the business? And that is possible. That is possible from uh, interviewing the people who are in that target segment, it, from looking at you know, um, how the metrics that you are measuring in terms of performance, how, how did it change, and building that proof, and building, again, going back to the external customer facing, building case studies. Right? That's essentially what L&D are doing. If you've got successful customers, then I can build case studies. And if you're building case studies, that means you're having the desired impact. And all of that, you know, nothing like a great case study to go and pitch that business case to your stakeholders to ask for more money. Right? Um, and, and I think that business case needs to come from more of a telling that narrative and, and gathering the data to help you tell that story better. Um, it is really where we need to go. But we're definitely seeing it, right? I think we speak to a lot of learning leaders day in, day out, and we're definitely starting to see more checks. You know, even budgets that were approved, you know, three months back, and now, you know, the C-suite are asking for one more check. Do we really need this, right? And we're going to start to see more of that, um, you know, over the next few quarters. Um, and so I think it's worth starting to invest in building that story now. Yeah, definitely. And that leads us nicely. Um, we had a question from Christina in the chat around this idea of metrics. And, and maybe you cover a little bit of it there, Nelson. But Christina, did you want to sort of come on and ask? And we can get Ajay and Kevin's thoughts as well. Great, because I have experience in LD and also as a trainer. And as a trainer for customer service, the metrics were very clear because they were linked to quality. So the parameters were well established. However, LD gets more abstract and also it touches points that are kind of difficult to measure, such as leadership. How good is a leader? How can we measure it? So any kind of metrics we can establish, and of course we can get it black and white. 
But sometime now that we're going to be highly challenged in our budget, as we used to be, um, if we can demonstrate from the data part that we are having an impact, it can be easier to sustain or to challenge back the budgets that probably will be decreased. Mm. Well, yeah, you guys want to get... Yeah, I was going to say, um, Kevin or OJ, I, I guess really is that, I mean, Nelson alluded to it a bit around um, what's the problem at hand and what's the metric, but I guess in general, what are some sort of metrics people can look to that will, will help them? Yeah, I, I'm happy to take a first stab at it and please uh, join in, uh, Kevin and Nelson. Uh, thanks, Christina, for the question. I think, you know, obviously it's, it's, uh, it's probably, if not the number one in the top three questions, right, that we're, we all have to encounter on a regular basis. What's the ROI? You know, how can we justify the expense, the cost? Um, and what are the metrics that we use to, 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 to demonstrate? And to me, I, I always think of it um, as um, two things because the impact in, in terms of business um, metrics, um, essentially what we're doing is performance improvement or behavior change, right? Those are the two things that we're trying to achieve. Um, performance improvement is a little bit easier to measure in my view. Behavior change is a lot harder. You mentioned the example of leadership. I think that's a, that's a very good example of that. Um, and that, yeah, I'm very curious just to see how other people uh, to, you know, um, take on trying to measure something like that. But for me, there's also the other side of, of um, the impact is also engagement. And I always, tr I always think of, try to think of these as, as separate things because um, often we neglect the engagement piece and we only talk about impact. Um, now for me, um, and this is just a little bit of a theory I've been playing with, so happy to be challenged on this, but it's difficult to achieve impact without engagement. So engagement on its own isn't useful necessarily, but it's difficult to achieve impact without the engagement. And what do I mean by the engagement metrics are, are people um, excited about what you are making? You know, are they talking about it? Are they sharing it? Are they asking for more? Um, are you building that engagement piece because that's often what it's going to help you drive the impact. Um, and the engagement is, um, that takes work sometimes. Sometimes you go into organizations and they have a great learning culture, everyone's sharing and everyone's sort of just happy to learn. Um, and that's already a great place to start. But in other places, that has to be built. And that takes time. That takes a lot of effort. But if you often reap the rewards once you're rolling out programs, because then you start to see the impact much more. Um, so to me, that's um, that's just, yeah, my, my view on that. Um, in, there are metrics that we could use for each one, but but don't, my, my only message would be don't forget about engagement um, because often, yeah, the business only cares about impact and, and, it's, and it's true. We've got to be talking in terms of, you know, those business metrics. Um, you know, whether it's efficiency or productivity or bottom line and all of those come into play. But um, is it fun? It's not, there isn't really always a metric for it, but but that is so important because, you know, you go into some places where just, it's just like a alien concept is what you mean fun. You know, we're not paying people to have fun here, but unless you're build, putting that work into building that that culture, you it just becomes much harder than to to move the needle when it comes to those other metrics so i'll stop talking for now and hand it over to one of you <laughs> i was gonna say i 100 percent agree Ajay. i mean we talk about this at how now called the the engagement gap and exactly you know along the lines of what you're saying is although engagement isn't the only requirement it is the primary requirement for any learning to take place right everything else follows right um and Actually, the, the only thing I'd say is, although the business or your C-suite, your business stakeholders, they do care about impact, um, engagement is actually a really good leading indicator, mm. right? Like, as in, if you've got learning experiences or you've bought tools, et cetera, you know, what good is a learning platform that no one uses, right? And so that is the leading indicator for the business to assess well, are people using this? Okay, therefore they find some value in this learning experience or in these learning resources uh, or, or in these initiatives that you're, you're running. So I do think engagement is 
that that kind of uh, leading indicator that helps you build the the business case. Come to your leadership example, uh, Christine. I often find that becoming a better leader is almost the value proposition, right? This is the value I'm going to give you. Is you're going to be a better leader at the end of this. However, I don't think it's the necessarily the outcome. The outcome for me needs to be more measurable. So I think it's a it's a layer down where you're looking at okay. Why do we need a better leader? Or why do we need this target segment to become better leaders? Well, right now they're having um, not so great career conversations with their direct reports. You know, what? Well, how is the actual challenge manifesting itself? Is it poor career conversations? Is it you know people leaving, um, or is it people not engaging? And that might be measured through an employee NPS. It might be measured through. Um, the actual performance itself. So I think once you dig in to a layer down, there is a business consequence by having ineffective leaders. And so it's trying to find where is that business consequence and what is the metric that will help us identify that business consequence. And then we can set the baseline, right? Let's just take employee MPS as an easy one. You know, it's X today. And actually, we think the impact on uh, the employee MPS will go up if we had better leaders who are having better performance and career conversations with their direct reports. So let's run this experiment. Let's try to, you know, upskill or enable our leaders to have those better conversations. And in a few months' time, let's check how that baseline moves. Right? Is the employee MPS gone to? Has it moved up? Has it gone down? So I think it's trying to find. What is the manifestation of that challenge from a from a business concept? Uh, but Kevin, any thoughts? Oh, I was uh, really glad that you both went first because uh, Christine, in full honesty, I, I haven't found something that that's ironclad and that works every time. But really, it's that, that idea of uh, I think when when it's put on L and D to come up with a metric again. I don't believe we can do it on our own, and it's more about the conversations that you uncover. And so, if I, I were in your position, or when I'd been in your position to come up with a metric that works, the first thing I do is I say, "Hold on, give me a moment," and then I start having conversations with learning, le- uh, not learning leaders, leaders across all the teams, and. I collect that evidence and pitch it back to the SLT who's acting, asking for measurement in their own terms. And so Nelson alluded to it's L&D's job to, to tell the story. I'm the worst storyteller, but if I have anecdotes, if I have stories, if I have data that's been cited by other leaders, I can then use that to uh, to build my own case. And uh, I, I really, uh, I think once you have that conversation, then you can develop that testable hypothesis. But um, in full transparency, transparency, I do not, uh, either I've been at companies that don't have enough data to make that case, or I'm not as familiar with the uh, how all the, the whole business ties together to make that case. But if you get other, put this on other, find friends, find your leader, uh, other leaders of other teams, get those stories, get that data from them, take it back to that SLT member and make that case. Yeah, and, and I think just I, I just to add on really quickly, well, just you know, I I would say to go back to what we were talking about earlier is to also think about how you can build a proof of concept, right? At very, um, at at very low investment to start with, because that's one of the things, um, that we will increasingly have to do is work within our limitations. You know, we're not always going to get. Um, the budgets or the resources or whatever it is that we need. But sometimes, again, it's it's about just embracing those and seeing what we can do within those limitations. Um, there was a lot of discussion um, recently about, you know, um, some of the authoring tools that, you know, the high-end authoring tools of, to create e-learning being quite expensive. And other people were sharing things that they built with free-to-use tools or open-source tools. Um, and building something like that, but then still focusing on that engagement piece, I think is quite powerful because you can then go to the business and say, this is what we did with this. Now imagine what we can do with with some extra investment to scale it up. Um, that for me is also one way, and I'm sure there are other other ways, um, but that could be an opportunity there for us to just, because there's so many tools and resources available now um, that we can leverage um, to put together a very compelling, um, you know, whether it's a minimum viable product or, or, a, or a proof of concept, um, and then we can say, this is, you know, this is, yeah, this, th- these are some numbers based on, on our current, you know, um, findings. And now we can maybe try the, the version two of this and then just scale it up from there. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Christina. That's a, a great question. And um, yeah, we're into sort of the last few minutes of the show now. And obviously, Kevin and Ajay, you both have experience in design and learning content. And obviously, everything we spoke about so far will have a direct or indirect influence on how we design learning content, right? So maybe just for the last couple of minutes, we can um, sort of get your thoughts on just how this might influence a more human centric um way of designing learning content and then quickly before i do that i'm going to do the shameless plug klaxon but in two weeks nelson and i are going to be joined by casper spiro who's the co-founder of easy generator who help companies create learning content to dive into this a little bit more so i'll, I'll drop that link in the chat for anyone who's interested and um yeah maybe just start with kevin what are sort of like a, just a quick summary of a couple of things people could do to create that more human-centric um learning content yeah, and, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and build off of Jay's last comment as well, where it's about, I think when you're when you're starting to, to search for, if tools are too expensive or you don't have an expensive platform or LXP or place to, to send resources, the uh, one of the, the best things that you can do is look where people are communicating, where do people go every day to communicate, and that's where you insert your learning. So for example, uh, Maybe if if we look at a spectrum, we think of trainings on the high end of everything and uh, maybe like an email, hey, you should learn about this resource being at the lower end. There are plenty of tools that you can use, uh, or not even tools, but just ways of communicating that your learners already access, whether that's Slack or whether that's uh, email. How can you microsize your learning? Uh, and uh, a case that, that comes to mind is Google Whisper courses. Um, this is just a uh, something that they did that they experimented with teaching manager, managers to deliver uh, better feedback. It was uh, 10 weeks. Each week they sent one email, I think, where um, they gave just one, what I used to call in teaching a 1% solution. What is that one skill, micro skill? What's one thing you could implement in your work today that affects the work tomorrow? And so uh, I definitely suggest you check that out. Um, and just thinking about the human-centric piece, it's it's always going to where your learners are. You're not going. Uh, you're not thinking about those uh, those interventions like training, which is like surgery, and you don't have resources for. But is it emails? Is it a job aid? You know, what's the smallest level of of test that you can do? Um, and I, I realize I was rushing for time because Jay, I gave you only a couple minutes to to add yours. No, that's fine. I do, I don't have much to add with, uh, to that. I think that was really good. Um, this whole, um, I think, conversation around human-centered design. And um, it's, it's really, uh, f to my mind, it's great. It's been something that's been building um, for, a, for a while, but now it feels like it's finally an established kind of approach in terms of putting the learner, your customer, your, the human at the center of everything that you do. And whether that's through design thinking or through other approaches that you're adopting, I think it's so important for us to be able to to do that, to, to prove value, to lead with empathy, to use storytelling skills to help your learner buy into the narrative of, you know, what what what's it's not just what's in it for me, you know, what what are the sort of opportunities this is going to unlock? Um, and how can I just be a better version of myself? You know, and I think that's um, ultimately um, the 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 sort of the goal um, to empower our our people within our organizations and together you know help help them all um be the best versions they can be i think there were a couple of really interesting questions yeah on there i thanks for replying to that gary ha very happy to continue the conversation on linkedin um over chat but thanks um sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions but but thank you all for <laughs> for joining and for adding your your own uh, views and perspectives um uh, for this yeah it was really great there's only one thing for it, Ajay. We'll have to have you and Kevin back on to uh, continue the conversation. Um, Absolutely. the sequel. <laughs> exactly. Um, Nelson, any sort of final thoughts on that before we wrap up the show? N not at all. Just a big thank you to Kevin and Ajay for being incredible guests. Um, so, yeah, really, really enjoyed it. And I definitely think there'll be a sequel on the cards. Absolutely. Well, in that case, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, like Nelson said, big thank you to Kevin and RJ. I think that was a really great conversation and look forward to having you on again in the future.